So hello everybody, my name is Samuel, and today we're going to be looking at uh, Xcode and building a basic calculator application. So uh, the reason why I'm doing this talk is basically because I know a lot of people at the lab are interested in using Mac as a developer platform, but don't necessarily have uh, the experience or there's not many other people here who are doing that. So we're just going to do something really simple uh, to have a look at sort of Objective-C, uh, the language, and Cocoa and just sort of cover the basics. How does that work, uh, and what can you do with it? So um, Xcode is a, uh, a download available on the Mac App Store, and you just go, uh, you can get a developer account to purchase that. Uh, sorry, you, have to get a, you can purchase a developer account, and you can download it. Alternatively, I think these days, you can actually get it for free, uh, just if you go to developer.apple.com and you just come through here and you can access its code as a download. So uh, the application itself is relatively straightforward. So we're just going to make a new project here. We've actually got an existing one that I was working through. But... And the project we're going to date today is a Cocoa application, which is basically a Mac application uh, which uses the Cocoa uh, framework. And so Cocoa has been around for probably the better part of 10 years now, and it's a development application development framework for developing GUI applications. And it encompasses a wide range of sort of user interface uh, paradigms and, you know, kind of an MVC type architecture for developing applications that kind of provide support for that. Uh, it builds on top of a whole bunch of other frameworks, and, you know, you can look at, there's hundreds of diagrams about how that's all structured, but today we're just going to go for looking at how you build an application, so we're not going to cover uh, the specific details there. So we're going to make a calculator. And uh, actually, all Mac applications have a company identifier associated with the application. These are how applications are kind of unique across uh, different people. So you know, you can just, if you have a domain name, you can throw it in there. It's actually the reverse form of a domain name. Uh, if you don't, you can just make one up uh, for development purposes, for testing. And unlike, say, a language like Java, uh, with Objective-C, people typically put a class prefix, like a single letter or two letters. So because we're making an application called calculator, we're just going to take the letter C and we're going to use it as a class prefix. It means all classes for our application are going to start with the letter C. It's kind of a cheap man's form of namespacing. Like in Java, you have like full-blown namespaces, which are pretty convenient. Um, and all these other features here, we're not going to worry about them today because we're just going to go for a simple uh, GUI application. So. So firstly, we're going to choose a location to put the project. So Xcode is always saving your project to disk. So it's basically an on-disk format. So don't try and share a project across the network or anything like that. And by default, the latest version of Xcode will integrate with Git for managing source code and provide some feedback and the ability to commit from the GUI. So when we've made a project, uh, basically, the structure of an Objective-C application uh, using the Cocoa framework is relatively straightforward for the default case. Basically, we have this one class called app delegate. So if you're familiar with like sort of uh, delegation, the idea of delegation, this class basically gives the behavior for our application. We just fill in the details for our application in this class, and we can use that to actually provide specific behavior. So right now, this is totally empty, and there's nothing going on in here at the moment. So we actually have to start making a calculator. So over here we have a zip file. And a zip file is an XML uh, nib file. And a nib file is an interface builder file. So this goes back quite a, there's probably like maybe about 30 years of history in these files, uh, all the way back to next step. And uh, so zip files are the modern form, the XML based because they go into version management easily. So the previous format was a binary format, I think, and it didn't version control very well. So at least with this format, people can, um, basically uh, be working on the same GUI uh, components and merge that and using source code or that type of thing. So in here, you basically have uh, several important things to consider. The first one is the files owner. So the files owner is kind of the controller for this GUI. So when you have a user interface component in the Cocoa framework, that has some relationship to your application code, right? So there's some sort of class which controls that part of the user interface, and that's called the files owner in this particular case. 
You also have something called the first responder. The first responder is actually part of the responder chain. So the responder chain is, uh, if you select a row in a table, then the responder chain would be that table, then that window, then your application, right? So this is a chain of uh, event processing that you can manage. And so things like our menu items, uh, these are all connecting to the first responder. So that when you click copy, then that copy message gets sent to uh, the topmost item in the responder chain. Finally, uh, over here, we have uh, a bunch of objects which are specific. So these are specific user interface components. So we have the main menu for the application, which has a bunch of menu items in it. We have the window itself, which we're going to make changes to shortly. Oh, no, let me move it over there. there we go. And we have something called the app delegate, which has this blue boxy icon here. Inside an interface builder file, you can actually instantiate objects. So that when you load the IB file into the application, it will instantiate the objects that you have listed in here. There are some benefits to doing this. The reason why you do this is because you can connect components in the user interface to uh, functions and variables in the implementation you've written. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually make uh, a calculator window, a very simple one. And actually, the new version of Xcode has some really nice layout features for doing automatic layout. So what do I want? I want to get, I get a, um, a text, text field, text box. There we go. That's the one. So this is where the number is going to go. We're just going to grab that, and uh, we're going to actually throw it up there. And so what you notice, you get a whole bunch of alignment guides, and you also get these uh, blue marks here, which are the new layout things, the new layout constraints. And these are basically constraining your layout uh, so that when you resize it, it will resize, uh, you know, in a way that's just not totally ridiculous. Uh, you know, in Java, for example, you end up having hundreds of boxes inside boxes inside boxes to manage your layouts. So in this particular case, uh, Cocoa tends, well, the user interface component of Cocoa tends to be very flat. It's very two-dimensional. There's not really much of a hierarchy in your user interface. You're just kind of throwing stuff onto the window. You can have hierarchies using boxes, but it's, you know, it's really um, only for visual, visual purposes. It's very unlikely you'd actually have boxes for layout purposes. And so then we need to get a bunch of buttons for the numbers. So let's just grab one that looks gradient push button. Which one looks nice? I like this one. There we go, that's what I want. And so you can see you just get these nice alignment guys. You can just drop it on there. And we're going to make that a bit smaller. And we'll just give it some number like, uh, so we just double click this, type in the number one. And we're going to just duplicate this and uh, make a, a nine by nine grid plus one at the bottom for zero. So if you're in Java, you might write a code like a loop to produce this. but. Uh, one of the benefits of this type of approach is that you can localize these files. You can actually provide the user interface to someone else to localize, and they can make changes to it as required. And the nice thing about the layout features is that if you have different localizations loaded in at runtime, it will actually adjust the layout, because obviously like different labels can be different widths, and so things might be pushed around, and so the layout will still maintain uh, you know, relative spacing. So uh, let me just commit that. Oh, we need to add some numbers for the uh, operators. So I'm going to put equals sign here. Grab that, copy and paste, drop that there. Plus, minus, uh, oh, that's OK. I can get like a nice character for it. Uh, If you do some symbolic stuff, like if you're typing in strange characters like maths and stuff, this is a really useful tool. Right, oh, good. Sometimes I press the wrong button. And so uh, we finally need to, 
There was one more button, I think. Yeah, clear button. That's kind of important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to make, we can't have two nines. That doesn't make sense, right? And so what you notice is in here, uh, as I resize this, the layout constraint is working nicely and um, just helping to make sure that uh, the text box aligns up correctly with the edges of the window. So uh, this is kind of the basic application we're going to make today. And so there's a number of things which have to occur in a calculator. Uh, firstly, when you press the button, then you get the appropriate number popping up in this text box. Uh, when you press this symbol, then you need to keep track of the state for which operators have been pressed. And then when you press another number in equals, then it should perform the calculation you selected. If you press clear, it should clear the state. And so you have a combination of a user interface and some controller, like an interaction layer, and some model which we're trying to represent, right? So I'll just check my list of stuff I've got to do. So we're just going to, because the application is quite simple, we are going to drop all of our state into this class, which is the application delegate, simply because it minimizes uh, the amount of work we have to do. So I'm just going to jump across here, and I'm going to grab stuff here. And so I'll explain this. NS decimal number, which NS stands for next step, it's a kind of the common prefix for the Cocoa APIs because it derives from next step back in the 80s. NS decimal number is a, um, a arbitrary precision number, so you can just have really big numbers or you know, with lots of decimal places to be accurately calculated. NS string is a UTF-8 uh, encoded string. And obviously you have the same convention as C, a star just means a pointer. Uh, so if you're familiar with C, then this basically just means uh, kind of a, a shared uh, pointer to this particular instance. And we're going to keep track of uh, the operator which has been pressed. And so the operator is going to be one of plus, minus, multiply, and divide. And so we're just going to put this definition up here. And so this is just a simple uh, enumeration of the various states the calculator can be in. And so the next step is that uh, with Objective-C, you actually have these nice things called properties. And so properties allow you to basically um, define a very high-level mapping between the class's internal representation of data and the way you interface with this. Um, so if I just go property, non-atomic, this means it's not protected by any kind of locking. Uh, retain, which means uh, that we have ownership over it for memory purposes. NS decimal number, pointer value. And then the same for string, display value. And we're going to do the same. Do we need to do the same? I don't think we need to do that for that one yet. If we have to, we'll come back to it. So. This is an interface definition. So in Objective-C, you have a very uh, strong separation between interface and implementation, similar to C++ and probably unlike Java, in the sense that all your code is in the same file. So we have a header file and also a, uh, what's called a .m file, which is an implementation file for Objective-C. And so this interface doesn't actually specify any functions to be defined at compile time. So we actually need to come to the implementation and we need to actually use a synthesized directive to specify that there is some implementation associated with those properties. So what this does is it basically build in the getting and setting methods. And so we just want to go uh, display equals display. So we have a property called display which uses this storage, and we have a property called value which uses that storage for value, right? And so now we can actually modify these values internally, but we can actually also bind to them in the user interface. So if we come back here to the user interface, and we click on this text field, and we come to the bindings, and we want to bind the value of this text box to the application delegate, and we want to actually bind this to the display string. right? So I'm just going to do that. And I'm actually going to go continuously update its value, because we want to, be able to type in values and have it change in real time. So bindings is a really key technology in Cocoa applications. Basically, if you have a user interface that is connecting back to your model, like a table that's displaying a list of users, or a text field which is displaying some information like the name of a particular user, then you can use bindings. 
bindings are kind of like uh, functions in a spreadsheet in some cases. For example, you can have a binding which will sum, uh, do a sum or a product or like a union of sets or join arrays together. You can do all sorts of things with bindings. So you can pull data from the model and put it straight into the user interface. And so the convenient thing is here, there's no code to write in this particular situation. We can just bind this directly to the, uh, the code in the delegate. And so, coming back to here, what's the next step we're gonna do? Right, so, in here, in the implementation, we wanna set some reasonable defaults. So we just wanna go self dot display equals empty string and self dot value equals any decimal number zero, right? And so we may change this in the future, but for now this is perfectly fine. Uh, as an example, we can put in anything in here, and if we run this, with any luck we get foo popping up in this text box. So basically the, the nib file and the application is now connected to the model that we're specifying using a binding. And uh, in a typical Cocoa application uh, that has maybe 10 or 20 different user interface components, you'll find bindings invaluable for reducing the amount of code you're writing, uh, simply because they minimize the amount of glue logic you have to write to join things together. So, the next step in this particular uh, application is to connect the buttons up. And so in Cocoa, we use a technology well, it's not really technology in itself, it's just called target action invocation. And the idea is that uh, each button can trigger uh, some kind of behavior to occur. And we can actually hook that up in a variety of different ways. But we'll just use the simplest form, which is essentially uh, we're going to hook this button up. What is going on there? Okay. So this one is the menu for the button. For some reason it won't pop up, maybe the screen resolution. And we just grab this thing, it's, it's called the sent action, and we can actually bind this to the app delegate. But we can't bind it actually because we haven't set up any actions for it to bind to. So in here, we're gonna use this thing called IB action. And this is kind of like a method definition and we're gonna call this one press number. And we're gonna have another one called press operator. And another one called press equals. And finally another one called press clear. Right, and we come back into implementation, we can just drop these in here. So the nice thing we auto complete, you just type a dash, you press option escape, and you can just uh, type in, so press, press clear, and press equals, uh, press number, and what was the other one? Press operator. And so now these methods do nothing, but we can put in a log message, so, NS log is the way you just dump something out to the console. Uh, right, so now we come back to the GUI, and we're going to grab the clear button. Uh, right click work this time, that's good. And I'm going to grab that selector. So it's now going from this button over to the app delegate, and I'm just going to click, uh, choose press clear. And now you can see this is connected. So the sent action is, when I click this button, it's going to call press clear on the application delegate instance inside that nib file. And so if I run this, uh, let's just bring this window over here. And we'll bring up the console. Right, with any luck. So you can see it right here, we're now getting that target action invocation is working correctly when we press the clear button. So this is also another really important part of Cocoa development is this kind of uh, uh, selector idea. So th these names here, uh, they're, they're quite different syntax from regular C uh, functions. And there's a good reason for that. They're actually not regular C functions. 
In Objective-C, you have the idea of a selector, which is kind of a hash table of uh, method names to implementations. And so the reason why this is, can be so dynamic is that actually these names are stored inside the lib file and connected at runtime. And so that if you are developing applications, you can even modify classes at runtime uh, if you need to, which is kind of monkey patching. Uh, it's not really that good to do that. People do it sometimes to get particular behaviors or fix bugs or you know, within the standard API and particular versions of uh, Cocoa and so on and so forth. So the connection here is, is, is not hard like it might be in a language like C where you're connecting function pointers together. It's, it's a bit, bit weaker than that. And so now we need to actually build uh, the calculator. So I'm going to cheat here a little bit. And for each one of these buttons, I'm going to give them uh, a tag, right? So something that's done typically is you just want to have a bunch of things, and they have uh, some mapping associated with them. So you actually give tags to things, to user interface elements. So I'm going to give that one one. This one is going to be two. This one is going to be, oh, where's my tag? I'm going to go three, four, five. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, that one's zero. And these ones here were one to four for each operator that we defined initially. You could do that too. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, no problem there at all. Um, it really depends. I'm just doing something as simple as possible. So uh, tag is very convenient in this particular case. And so then all of these, uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit tedious that you have to bind them all individually. It used to be that you could select them all at once, but for some reason, that functionality seems broken in the current version of Mac OS X, uh, sorry, Xcode. They are releasing a new version of Xcode about once every two or three months at the moment, because they've got so many new ideas and so many new features they're trying to get out there, uh, which unfortunately for developers means that often you find things are buggy. Um, in particular, in this version of Xcode, if you undo, if you press the undo button, sometimes uh, in the text editor, it just goes totally crazy. And um, you can't see a change, and it just, it's like totally out there. Ah, I can't scroll down, I don't know. Why can't it record at 1080p? Hold on, I'm just going to move this up here. So this is a little bit tedious, and there would be ways to speed this up, but we'll just do it as simple as possible. Da -da -da. Nearly there. Right, and this one here was the press clear button. Oh, it's already connected. And this one here is the press equals button. And this one was the press operator button. So now the UI is pretty much done, everything is wired into this uh, implementation here. And so we just need to write the implementation for a calculator. So it's relatively straightforward. Um, actually, one thing we haven't put in here is, oh, we've got that, that's good. So if you press clear, then we're just going to reset to the default values. She will just grab this one. And self dot. Offer, uh, here we go, it's not. So we don't have a property for this one because it's just an internal value we're using for keeping track of the state of the calculator. 
It's not bound to the user interface in any way. And uh, so the firstly, when we want to press a number, we basically have to up update the display string. And so a really simple implementation of that is as follows. So self.display equals uh, you know, string, uh, string with format. And so this is a kind of a C string formatting, simply because next step comes from the days of C. Uh, the string formatting is very C, uh, very C oriented, uh, which generally is pretty concise and pretty straightforward. Um, so we're going to put percent at symbol, which means an object, and we're going to go uh, percent D, which means integer. And then after here, we just put self dot display and send a tag, right? And so the tag is an integer, and self-display is the previous string. So if we run this now, then pressing these numbers uh, builds up a number, as we'd expect. And actually, even hitting clear should get rid of it, right? So what's nice about this is this code doesn't really know anything about the user interface at all. Uh, it, it really has a very low coupling to the user interface, which is really with big applications, we have sort of 50 or 100 you know, model files or controller files and lots of different interactions. The less coupling you have, the easier it is to build those applications and have them work bug free, uh, simply because you don't have to concern yourself with sorting stuff in the right order to be displayed in a table. The user interface can handle all that pretty much, or you can just make a very lightweight controller that sits on top and doesn't. Um, so you're really, you're really trying to minimize your, your, the concerns you're dealing with at any one time. So the next thing we have to deal with is when you press an operator. So when you press an operator button, we need to take the current number and allow the user to type in another button, uh, another number, and then when the user presses equals, then it should perform the calculation. So we actually need to figure out uh, the tag number corresponds. So up here, actually, we have this definition here, one, two, three, and four, and we set each button to use the tag one, two, and three, four for those corresponding operators. So actually down here in the code, we're just gonna go operator equals sender tag, and self.value equals ns decimal number, decimal number with string, uh, self.display. So we're just gonna, um, we're going to copy, uh, we're going to convert the string that's being displayed into a decimal number. So this can just be any kind of number. There are other ways you could do this. So you could display the decimal number directly on the, in the text field just using a number formatter. Or there's, a, there's a variety of ways you could do this, but this is just basically the simplest way I can think of. So once we've captured the operator and the value, then we actually also need to reset the display back to empty string, ready for the next string to be typed in. Uh, sorry, the next number, which is going to be a string. Finally, up here, when the user presses equals, we need to handle uh, the previous set of cases. So we're just going to go uh, autocomplete, great. So when the user presses equals, we're going to see what operator they typed in. And then if that's the case, we're going to say uh, self.value equals value decimal number by adding uh, next. All right, and up here we're going to have to go ns decimal number next equals ns decimal number decimal number with string. So we, get, we have the old number, which is self.value, and the number the user just typed in, which is a next. And we're going to add those two together and put it back in value, so we kind of accumulate there for addition. And finally, we're going to update the display so it shows a new value. Just like that. So we just want to turn uh, the decimal number back into a string. Now, you can use a number formatter if you want localization support. We're not going to worry about that for this example. So the same is true for all the different operations. And I've actually already written the code, so I'm just going to grab that and plonk it in there. So this is actually pretty much identical code. 
And so this is just uh, using decimal numbers, which is nice because they're relatively accurate as opposed to using integers, which can overflow or floating point numbers, which are not very precise. Uh, and so we just have these four operators here. Uh, so hopefully if we run that, we sort of start seeing the desired behavior of a calculator. Uh, that's slightly different. One times two equals. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> that was funny. So what's it doing there? It's actually quite good we made a mistake, because now we can have a look at how you debug stuff. I have to push equals twice. Why is that? So uh, rather than just intuitively looking at the code, I'm going to put a breakpoint in here. So along the side, you have this uh, kind of gutter. And we want to see what's going on in the press equals routine and why that's not actually working as we expect it to. So we can just drop a breakpoint on there, just this little blue arrow. And so we run the program again. And we're going to type in 1 times 2. And we hit equals. So now we have jumped into this uh, method. And we have access to all the local state uh, as well as the class itself down here in this box. And we also have access to LLDB, which is really similar to GDB. So in here, after we just do one step, we can see that the next number we typed in is 2, which is correct. And self has a value which is 1, which is correct. So those two values are correct. So what are we mucking up? So the operator, what's the operator? C multiply, that's correct as well. So it comes down here. We can just click. This means go to the next statement. It's going to be executed in the, uh, I mean, it, this one here you step into, and this one here kind of steps over function calls. We don't really want to go into the function. We just want to see what's happening in this function itself. I had to press equals twice. So I don't know why that was. Oh yeah, so I was correct. Oh, so I was just like, I can't do maths. That's my problem. <laughs> uh, maybe I just haven't slept enough in the last thirty hours. So, so basically, um, yeah, it seems like we've got the right behavior there. But so, it's, so debugging programs is really important, and uh, there's a lot of things in there you can do. So in GDP, the, the standard one for Objective C is actually, uh, well, actually in C, right? Uh, you just use something like P self, and that prints out like a pointer. But this is totally pointless. It's, I mean, it's good for, for debugging C code, because you just want to print out pointers and structs and stuff. But in Objective C, you have some nice printing. So if I go PO, which means print object, then I can print object uh, self uh, value. right? And so we get uh, a nice, pretty description of that, that particular value. And so when you're debugging programs, often you'll find that it's quite convenient to actually implement a description method. So this is a method which you can override. And whatever you put in here, you'll get out in the debugger uh, as, as this in, you know, when you go PO, the object, right? And so uh, the biggest problem in this situation is if you crash inside description, it's obviously not going to work very well. Uh, so you need to make sure that description is relatively fast. Uh, you're not doing any huge operations in there to compute the displayed value. So coming back to this again, uh, it seems like we have a working program. So let's try 2 times 2 equals uh, get rid of the breakpoint. So we just, to get rid of the break, just click and drag it off, hit play again, move back here. So it seems like it's working. I'll clear that. So what's interesting about the fact that we bound this text box to value is that we don't actually have to use the buttons to manipulate. We can just type in values directly, say 45 times 2 equals. We still get the correct result that we're after. That's one of the critical things about bindings, is they allow you to interact with the model consistently. And so in this case, uh, even though we have this method which is actually updating the number itself, uh, where was it, press number, this one here is adding one number to the end of the string each time. Because we're just interacting with the same property each time, we can access that multiple different ways. It's like we're interacting with the model in different ways. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, that's cool. Right now, you can start chucking in anything you want. Now, the way that it works is you can actually put formatters on things. So you have uh, a variety of formatters. This one is a date formatter. This one is a number formatter. Uh, and you can have like all sorts of different custom behavior. Like if you want to have IP addresses or like credit card numbers, you want to do validation, you can just override one of these and drag it into your UI. So you can do pretty advanced stuff with formatters. Um, right now, this will accept any characters you type into it. Uh, if we apply this, 
it will probably work as expected. But the problem is that now the value binding is actually bound to a number, not a string, right? Because this is now only having a number. So the value of this object in the user interface is now actually a number, not, not a string. That's my understanding of anyone without actually checking. I'm pretty sure that's the case. We can easily verify that. We just, we'll just run it and it won't work. Or maybe it will work. All right, it's still working. That's interesting. OK, so that even if we run this again and we put in a string, will it avoid that? Oh, oh that's weird. What's going on? Did I even apply it to the right thing? Hold on. Oh, I have to select this. Here we go. That should work. So right now, this is not quite working expected. So it's told us that we can't type in this value. There are ways you can do that continuously so that you actually just can't type in that value. But off the top of my head, uh, I couldn't tell you to look at the documentation for that specific behavior. There'll be something in the binding uh, validates immediately that could be it. No, if I tab out, though, it does it. But it's not quite what you're after. But there's definitely ways to achieve that behavior, obviously. So the last thing I want to do today, so we've basically made the whole application for a calculator. We've got a model. We've got some controller behavior. Uh, it, it's really quite a simple application. But I thought one other interesting thing we can add to this is basically uh, a string which shows the current operator has been pressed. So if we just, uh, we're just going to call it operator string. We just add a new property here because we're going to be binding to it. So as Mac OS X has become more advanced, with some of the technologies, one in particular called Grand Central Dispatch, it integrates uh, quite high-level threading primitives, which allow you to build uh, threaded code or like parallel code, code which is basically running in parallel, uh, you know, algorithms or user interface things or rendering. Uh, as an example now, with the latest version of Mac OS X, when you hit Control uh, Command S to save a document and using core data, it will actually do that on a background thread. If you make modifications to that model while it's saving, it will abort and retry the save uh, at some point or maybe it, there's some particular behavior it has in there. But as long as you don't make modifications from the time you press Command S, it will save the document in the background so the application is still responsive. So there's a couple of uh, interesting features in the latest version of Mac OS X which are actually really trying to utilize more than one CPU at a time. So when you put uh, non-atomic, what you're really saying is that this will only be accessed from one thread at a time, and there's no locking involved. When you put atomic around it, when you put atomic on a property, it will basically insert the code required to make sure that you don't have synchronization problems when reading and writing that particular property. It's not going to solve all your parallel problems, uh, but it will solve some of them in specific cases. Uh, so if you interact with an object on multiple threads, uh, this is one way to ensure that you don't at least corrupt individual, individual uh, properties. Uh, so because we're not concerned with that, we're just going to all have it non-atomic. No, no problem at all. But there will be performance overhead. Locking is always something you should avoid if you can. I mean, you should, shouldn't lock just for the hell of it. Uh, you should definitely do it just when it's necessary. So uh, finally, when we press the operator, we just want to um, we want to actually print that on the screen uh, next to the, the button. Or actually, next to the window would be good, wouldn't it? So we're just going to make a label. I'm going to drag that on top of there. I'm going to make it really small. Let's just put a plus in there and get it. So let's put it there, it's good. And so what we're going to do is we're going to bind that again to the app delegate, and we're just going to go operate a string. <coughs> so now this one here will be connected to whatever we set over here. And I'm just going to cast. So when the button is pressed, there is one argument here, and it's called sender. And this is who sent the event. And we can actually, we know this is a button in our case. It's not really good programming practice to do this, but this is fine in this case. 
then we're just going to grab the title of the button and stick it into the operator string when you press the button. So now when we run this, with any luck, oh, actually there's one other problem. It's telling me right here, I haven't actually implemented the synthesized directive. Right. So there you have it, a really simple calculator application, and we've basically covered all the fundamentals of throwing together simple Cocoa applications. Any questions? Everyone could build a massive application now with hundreds of windows and Right, yeah, I could talk about that. So, is anyone, who, who, how many people here, show of hands, are familiar with like C? Is everyone familiar with C? Right? Who is familiar with C? Right? Anyone familiar with Objective C? Everyone is new to Objective C, right? So, Objective C is a language which has a lot of inspiration from uh, Smalltalk. Uh, Smalltalk uh, and a variety of other languages in the history of computer science, prehistory of computer science, maybe even. The nature of the syntax is such that it's quite a dynamic language. So as I suggested earlier, uh, we have these things called selectors, and so we have the return type here and a list of arguments. And the arguments are actually named arguments in the sense that each argument has a name associated with it. So if we ever look at this file uh, here, we can actually see that do any of these methods have multiple arguments? That's really sad. Okay, so it's a good example. If I have a decimal number, then I can create a decimal number with the mantissa in exponent and whether it's negative. And these are actually named parameters. So uh, in here, these are individual arguments to this function call, and each one has a name in front of it. Actually, the name of this method is actually, um, if you were write, writing the selector out, it would actually look like this. Selector, and then you just put in the parts before the colon, so decimal number. So this is the actual syntax for the method name. So in C, your method name is always before the bracket, but actually, this whole string here, that's the method name in Objective-C. And actually, this function here is a hash function that happens at compile time, and it hashes your method name into an offset, which is then mapped to, uh, actually the technology has changed significantly in the recent releases of Objective-C, but it used to be that they would basically um, use a hash table at runtime to look up methods to implementations. But these days, they also have some optimizations for, I think they have a V table, approach, but like C++. So for method names which are commonly used, they actually have a V table implementation or something going on. I'm not completely sure about how they do that technology because it's quite recent. So the other thing about Objective-C is that method dispatch in C is typically written with the brackets after the function name. So you might see uh, function arg1, arg2, like this. But the equivalent syntax in Objective-C is sort of like target function arg one, blah, arg two. Uh, so in this case, the bracket actually is before the uh, target you're pa passing it on to. So all messages in Objective-C are basically going towards an instance of an object, whereas in C, you can just have free functions which have no target. And so uh, in this particular case, this is not completely the same. In C, if you were writing some C++ code, for example, it would be more like more like this, for example. So the syntax is uh, a little bit confusing to start with, but generally uh, it's quite nice because the functions are very readable. In C, it can be quite hard to know what a particular argument is doing, whereas in Objective C, you have quite a lot of clarity on which individual arguments are doing what. Uh, it definitely makes development quite fast because you can just sort of read through code and see what it's doing. So the other part which is slightly different uh, in terms of defining classes is you have uh, interfaces which is basically the interface that you're dealing with, and a corresponding implementation. But you don't have to just have one implementation. You can open and close the implementation as many times as you want. So 
So I could throw all this stuff into a separate file if I was feeling like it. Right, and it will still compile just fine. Oh, look at that, it didn't compile at all. I think I spelled something wrong. Oh, what have I done? What am I talking about? No, scrap that. It is possible, but I can't show you without thinking about it more. My brain is not really operating at 100% at the moment. So. Uh, but what I often do is I often have implementations spread out over multiple files. And even in this part here, uh, you can extend other objects with methods. So NS object is like object in Java, like Java lang object. In object to see, it's called NS object. Then we can add what is called a uh, category on NS object. And we can add arbitrary methods to that, to that uh, instance of NS object. Like any, every instance of NS object will get these additional methods. Um, so we just make a new method called foo, but it's totally pointless. Right, and so now, I mean, it's totally pointless, but I mean, we can go self dot operator string foo bar. And now that every, every instance of NS object will now have this method. So when you're building up uh, large bases of source code for an application, you can sort of start spreading some of that functionality across multiple files. So you might have, uh, for your document class, which is managing your document state, you might have part of it managing uh, a database, part of it managing user interface stuff, part of it managing something else. So you might separate that into separate classes, or you may, you know, you can basically uh, separate the code out uh, structurally if necessary, if, if, if it helps with the implementation. So, uh, what I'll do is, if anyone's interested in Objective-C, what we should probably do is have a chat afterwards and I'll point you towards some good guides. Uh, one of the best ones is actually Cocoa Dev Central. Uh, it's a really nice introduction to programming in Objective-C. But the last thing I wanted to talk about very briefly was using Git uh, for managing projects. So, as I pointed out, Initially, uh, Xcode produced um, uh, the Git repository when I created the project. And what it's showing down here is these M symbols. And that actually means that the file has been modified since it was originally created. And so what we can do is we can just grab these files, and we can just go to source code, control, and commit selected files. And it's just showing us what we've done, what we've added. Uh, the user interface is XML, like I said earlier, and we can just say uh, first version. You should never use a commit message like this, it's terrible. Right? And so now the M symbol has gone away. And if I start making modifications, obviously you expect it to come back. Right? So it's quite a nice way to keep track of, at least in the IDE, what files have been modified. So if you didn't have bugs and suddenly you have bugs, where have you like screwed up the code, right? So it's like the first thing that's quite useful. The second thing that's quite useful is collaboration. So a lot of the Xcode development environment is geared towards collaboration, especially now that it's built on top of Git for version management. And so what I'm going to briefly do is show you a tool called uh, GitHub. And hopefully uh, most people have had some exposure to GitHub. So who knows about GitHub? One, two, three. Okay, so if you don't know about GitHub, you should probably spend five minutes on it today, sign up for an account. It's a fantastic place for uh, basically interacting with other developers and seeing people who are releasing code and managing code and all sorts of stuff. So I have all these projects on there, um, also interacting with other people with projects, and I'm just going to create a new repository called Calculator. And there's no URL, and anyone can access it because it will be under open source license. The next step, so we're just we're going to put a pause on that. I'm going to come back here. I'm actually going to create a README file because it's quite important when you publish projects to just put a README file that people can actually understand what's going on. And I'm going to use a formatting called Markdown. And Markdown is pretty simple, but I've actually already written a file for this, so I'm just going to grab that. This is a MIT license. So if you're releasing source code open source, probably use the MIT license. 
Uh, it's one of the easiest licenses to use. And so now you can see this file has been added. So this has been added completely. It's not modified. It's just completely added. Right. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to undo that change. We don't want that modify. And we're going to actually commit this file. And go added read me. Right, so now that file is in there. Now, is it still building? Because I don't want to commit. You should never commit broken builds uh, into a repository. And don't commit build files and don't commit hundreds of gigabytes of crap because it just makes everyone else angry. Uh, so make sure you have read up about using source code control if you're planning on using it. At least just spend five minutes <laughs> reading about it before you go and commit the Microsoft Visual C++ runtime installer. So anyway, so back over here. <clears throat> um, so I've already set GitHub, but you can follow these instructions if you're running a Unix environment and you've got Git install. If you have like Linux, uh, app git install, git core, uh, Mac, install Mac ports, or if you have Xcode, Git comes with Xcode. Um, so there's a variety of ways of getting access to Git. And the most important line is actually this one here, which basically makes a connection between the local repository and distant repository. Let's get rid of all that junk. So actually, as you've seen, I've been committing files and adding files with no remote repository. So if anyone, who's familiar with Subversion? Everyone's familiar with Subversion? Who likes Subversion? Who comes to work thinking, goody, today I get to use Subversion? Oh, yeah, we're <laughs> one of you. Right. You obviously like serious pain, man. So, so basically, the nice thing is that when I go on holiday, I can be coding, which just sounds like a contradiction, but you know, I, can be, I can be coding and I can commit something in the evening without having to have access to the internet. And I can start working again tomorrow, and then the next day, make some more commits. And I have a track, I can keep track of what I've been doing when I really should have been like swimming or something. Uh, so anyway, right now, desktop calculator. So we have the project on disk. And if you look carefully, you can see there's the .git file uh, directory. And so in here is a bunch of stuff for keeping track of things. And actually, by default, uh, we don't have any remote so if we come back out here and we just run this command, then now we have a remote uh, repository set up. So this is not a client-server connection like in Subversion. This is more like a peer-to-peer -peer connection. It's like saying, you can send source code to this person easily. And in fact, I can commit source code without even adding that in. I can actually just go git push. Uh, do I have to put master first or afterwards? We'll try and see what happens. So probably it's going to ask me to specify a branch. So this means, that, say you're having uh, a hack festival and you have five people around on a desk, right? And everyone wants to share the code. Then when someone makes a change, they can actually just send that out to everyone else if they have like SSH, or they can actually pull it from their machine. So you actually have like a Git running on your machine uh, through SSH. People can wire into your machine, pull the changes back out again. And you can just do that in a completely decentralized way. So the reason why you use GitHub is it's quite convenient for lots of people to access your code. But you know, GitHub is purely, uh, sorry, Git is purely decentralized. You can basically work in a very decentralized uh, manner uh, with very few sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, overheads, which you might experience with subversion. So uh, now that that's been pushed, so actually it's just told me it's made a new branch, and it's pushed my local master to the remote master. So what that means is locally I have a branch called master, and remotely on GitHub I have a branch called master. But those names could be different. If I want to have like a stable release and like a bleeding edge or like a version 1.0 or whatever. So actually what we can do right now is I'll add a tag. So git tag dash a 1.0. I have to add a description, end of seminar, right, git push github 1.0. Oh, what have I done? origin. So now what this does is it now fires that tag. And it, all a tag is is it's just like a pointer into your source code saying this tag points to this particular revision. And so if we come back to GitHub now, uh, with any luck, this is now looking much more fancy. Right? And so we can see the readme file we put in there relatively nicely formatted. And we have all the files that we made in there. And we can even see uh, a list of commits. So we come in here, commits. Uh, add a Remy first version initial commit. So this was the Xcode created those files to start with. So Xcode just created all that stuff. There was nothing in there when we started. And 
we can go forward. So if we just, uh, how do I go forward? Here we go. Come back here, have a look at this one. And so then we added a whole bunch of stuff in there and so on. So finally, uh, once you create, the nice thing about GitHub is once you've created a version, uh, you can actually come over here to, where is it? Downloads. We've changed it slightly. Tags 1.0. And you can just grab all the code as a 1.0 release. So uh, even though this is really like not really a 1.0 release for a calculator because it has four operators, but but you, basically it's quite it's quite a convenient way to say to people, look, here's a download for the source code for this particular release. They can just go in there and grab it. So as an example, like a larger project that I've got, uh, so there's uh, various different releases from you know about a year ago to seven months ago. Oh, look, even like four months ago, so their ordering is a bit whack. That's weird. Um, so, you know, it's a very convenient way to sort of, if you have software and you want to be able to give it to people, and you can get private GitHub uh, account as well, which lets you do sort of commercial development. So if you have several people working on a commercial project. So I've got a commercial project here as well. So these are all open source projects. If you have a commercial project, then no one else can see that stuff, but you still, you can share it among a group of people, uh, and it's very, very convenient. So along with that, uh, GitHub has lots of features like issue tracking, so people can put, um, you know, put bugs against your code. Uh, you can see interesting things like who's using your code. Uh, so this builds a network of people who actually have forked this particular code. Uh, it's not very interesting at all because no one's done it recently. People can watch your code. So if you have a project, people can uh, sort of follow your, your project and see what's going on. Um, people can fork code. So as an example, uh, I'll go and bug Henry. It's called printer setup. No. <coughs> so one of the things that's quite cool about this is if I just uh, there'll be a spelling error in here probably. So I'm going to click edit this file. Let's see, can you find something I can just modify surreptitiously? I oh, know, I'll just call it. There we go. And so what I do is I'm just going to go, and I can't spell either. Oh, it's just doing that. OK, here we go. And so now, because I've accessed the repository, it has actually just committed that change to printer setup. And so now that has been changed on his account, because I have access to that particular repository. What's quite cool is if I don't have access to that, it will fork that project, make the change to my local repository, and then send that developer a notification that someone has made a change to their project and that they should accept that. And they can go in there, they can look at the change, they can either accept or reject that change. So really, to summarize, there is a quite an advanced feature set here for doing collaborative development. And if you are interacting with other people who are in different countries, this is simply a fantastic platform for doing that kind of work. It keeps track of your history, it keeps track of your bugs. There's a wiki in there for keeping track of documentation. You can put, you can even like host a website via this tool. Uh, you know, multiple people can work on it. They don't even have to get installed to edit files. Uh, it's just really straightforward and really fantastic in almost every possible way. I love Git. It's just fantastic. I even have like a sticker. If you want stickers, I've got stickers. You get one after the after the talk. Lee has a sticker on his door. Is it just for for a particular set? No, in any language. Like you know, say you're doing your say you're doing your like PhD or thesis or something. You can put in your LaTeX file. Um, if you're doing uh, some Python or Ruby, you can just do that. If you've got some, uh, you know, actually Git Git is uh, written by Linus Torvalds, the guy who made Linux, right? And uh, it's just super advanced in terms of the efficiency. Uh, you know, it does really amazing things, and it works really fast. Uh, it's basically the fastest source code management platform out there, uh, simply because he has spent a lot of time optimizing uh, stuff. You know, you can look on the mailing list for Git, and he's just like, oh, I was looking at the hash function. I was trying to like write the code. And I was trying to make it slightly faster on x86, so I like wrote this assembler version of the hash code. In a loop, and you know, it's just cool. I mean, someone's working on it; they're paying attention to the efficiency. So, you know, you can be guaranteed that Git is going to be pretty much the fastest source code management in general. You said that all projects are public, pay for one. Right. So, if you pay for, actually, what I've been telling Lee to do for the last uh, 12 months now, probably, is to actually put in the credit card number for the HitLab. So, there is actually a HitLab 
um, organization, I think. But I don't think there's actually, there's me and Lee, and like, so we need to, someone needs to pay for it basically. Uh, but th th and then everyone can put their project on there and collaborate, we're fantastic, that's my opinion. Um, but you know, uh, the, the prices are very reasonable, you can get educational discount as well, I think like the, the entry level price, uh, let's see if we can get it. Uh, how do I find pricing? But anyway, that's kind of outside the scope anyway. But locally. Yeah, locally, completely locally. Yeah. So what kind of features um, are you using? Uh, so when you use Git locally, you're just using it for source code management. But GitHub provides a lot of features like wikis and ticket management and that kind of stuff on top of Git. Uh, so you can still do all that kind of stuff, uh, like managing source code. Like people can modify files, commit them, go back and forward. All that kind of stuff is still possible. One of the, if you're just getting into Git, actually one last thing I'll mention is that um, so in here, uh, by default, we've just been using the command line. But there is actually a GUI tool, uh, which is not that pleasant, but it actually is really functional. And so this is the GUI tool, and uh, it will show you things. It, it's pretty horrendous, because I think it's written in TCL, so it's, it's cross-platform, it looks just as bad on every platform. Um, but, it, but it is really functional, so you can commit files by clicking on the net icon there. I mean, it's not really clear what, how you're supposed to do that. It's just kind of like a mystery. Uh, the whole user interface, and then you type in a commit message. Uh, so what did I change? I don't think I changed anything in here really. Oh, I added the readme. Didn't we commit that already? I don't know what it's talking about. And so uh, once you commit the change, then you can push that, and then you can choose where you want to push it to. So at the moment, Origin is pointing towards GitHub, um, but you can point it to like another directory on your computer. You can, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities. GitHub is not like a client-server relationship. It's basically if you have two Git repositories on your computer, you can push from one to the other just locally if you wanted to. You can duplicate them, you can go back and forward in them independently, you can push patches across back and forth. It's really, uh, really quite uh, convenient if you're doing development to have that sort of available, especially if you have a habit of creating bugs like most developers. And so finally, uh, so in here you have a lot of access to visualization as well. So um, this one here just lets you see the files in that particular point, but this one is quite a cool one. You can basically go back and forth in time. Where is that window gone? Oh, here we go. And so you can see uh, any forks that have occurred. So if you split, if you create a branch and then you join that branch back together, so if you explore some other feature and you decide that it was good or bad, then maybe you get rid of it or maybe you merge it back into the mainline source code. Then you can see this uh, here, and you can see we put the commit in, you can see what was actually done at what date. Uh, so you know, it's a relatively comprehensive user interface. It's just not that nice to use. So GitHub definitely provides a pretty picture uh, in a web interface so that multiple people can access it all at the same time. Any more questions about anything? We just get a look at the XML code for the zip file. Oh, sure. Can you actually do that with it? Um, I can even do it within GitHub. But I can probably do it with an Xcode. But let's just do it on GitHub because I know that will work. So the zip file is a kind of a new thing. It's sort of only been the last two or three years. Some of my old applications still use nib files. And the cool thing about nib files was that when you, it used to be that Xcode was Xcode plus interface builder. And interface builder was for doing the GUIs and Xcode was doing the coding. But now these days, uh, they're just one and the same application, which is kind of convenient because you get much better integrated experience. But what people would do is, because you had a nib file editor, you could actually go into existing applications and modify the user interface. So you actually get like a, like a pre-built application that someone has made and you can just kind of hack and add like new buttons that do different things and stuff. It was really quite cool. Uh, that stuff has become more complicated these days since you can't directly edit nib files. With the public repositories of people edit your code, do they, do you get a notification? You'll get a notification that someone has forked your project and they've sent you what's called a pull request, which means that they want you to pull the change they made. So you get a notification and you can even discuss it, you can have a back and forth conversation where people can chime in on that. So does anyone use uh, MTDAPD? or like forked, forked D or anything like that. It's like a, it's a tool for playing music over wireless uh, or wired networks. So like you can stream music to uh, iTunes and stuff. And there was like a massive discussion because it, in the recent version of iTunes it stopped working because there was like something wrong with the code. And it was just like, you know, uh, over the period of like about sort of four or five months, there was just this huge discussion about what was going on. 
and people were like proposing different patches and different fixes, and some were working consistently, some weren't. So uh, I'll show you that in a second, but just to fill it with Lee, so this is the zip file here. Um, so you just see it's kind of a key value data storage. Uh, so we have, let's see if we can find something that makes sense. So we have like the menu there, there's the menu items. Uh, you know, it's, it's really quite straightforward. You could probably turn it into something else, like you could write XSLT if you were, yeah. it's pretty massive, isn't it? There are a lot of buttons in that user interface. <laughs> so I would see if I can find that discussion we were having the other day. Hold on. Um, Has it been fixed? Uh, I think it's nearly done. Notifications, I think it'll pop up in here. Uh, here we go, this one. So there was just a bug, it was timing out, and so like, this was a f originally in the issues, and someone has said like, you know, can someone fix this? And there's 31 people taking part in this conversation, and there was just a massive amount of discussion. You know, like, I mean, people put in code, and they would see there was an example somewhere. Someone's like, put some code there. That's the patch they used to make it work. People have talked about it, discussed it, and finally, People are confirming that one person's release has worked and there's actually dev files available which you can download and test. So in terms of the collaboration possibilities, I mean, there's 31 people here discussing a bug in a popular piece of open source software. And it's just a great forum for people to come together and go, this works, this doesn't work. How can we fix this? And that can even apply in a group of three to five people if you're just working on a project. Uh, you know, it's just fantastic tools, really. Just better communication just helps in every, every way, really. Any more questions? So everyone is 100% proficient in Git. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, and I hope that was interesting. And if you uh, have any comments or you want any more advice, uh, you know, feel free to talk to me. Um, I'll be here for the rest of this week. I'm more than happy to point you in the direction of resources. Uh, actually, one final really good resource for Git is Git Magic. This is a fantastic document about how to use Git. It's translated into about 10 different languages. Um, and it just kind of explains right from the start how to use Git. So if you want to get into Git, that's a good starting point. And the other one I mentioned actually earlier was devcentral.com. And this is learning Objective C. Uh, it just basically has, you know, right from the very basics. So probably like most of you guys could start from like about lesson 10 or something, but. Uh, it, it really has right from the very basics, calling methods, that kind of stuff. So, so this is a really good resource as well. Um, you know, overall, I've been developing Objective-C for about 10 years, I would say now, and uh, it's just been a really good experience. I've, I've never really run into any major problems, like, you know, I wish it did this or I wish it did that. Uh, it's a very, very convenient framework, and Apple supports it in lots of different ways. So there's frameworks for doing audio, video processing, uh, you know, OpenGL integration is pretty good these days and getting better. Um, you know, it's just frameworks in there for doing all sorts of stuff. So it's uh, very comprehensive. The only downside of that, I guess, is that it's not very easy to port that to other platforms. So that is probably the biggest negative. Uh, on the other hand, you might say that if you're just developing code for Mac, then it's good enough that it just runs on a Mac. Um, there are efforts with tools like Newstep which is an implementation of Objective-C and the Next Step API to make applications portable to Linux. Um, but, but again, it's basically the biggest downside is the fact that it's Mac-only, Mac-centric. Thank you very much. Thank you.